Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books. My name is Sean Duffy. I'm the uh, organizer of this program. I uh, just want to make a few announcements before we start. First of all, our, our symposium is this weekend. This is the mask, and I'll show you better what that looks like here in a second. Um, so yeah, it is Walter Ruther's birthday, so we will be talking about uh, Mr. Ruther in just a minute, and we'll stay tuned after the program because we'll be showing our uh, video tribute to Walter Ruther. Now this is what the mask looks like. This is uh, Carol and George Jeffries who are associated with the United Auto Workers. They bought a couple of masks. You can get them for $15 each. Just send me a, an email or a, or a Facebook message. This is what they look like closer up. That's the logo for our symposium, which is this Saturday. Like I said, stick around for the video after. And uh, speaking of the symposium, it's this Saturday the 5th, uh, beginning at 11 a.m. We have a good lineup of speakers, including Dan Graff from Notre Dame, Mike Stout, who's an activist from Pittsburgh, who's written a book, Chuck Keeney, who is one of the founders of the uh, Mine War West Virginia Mine Wars Museum, and Cicero Fain, who will talk about Black Huntington and labor in Huntington. Uh, this Thursday at 6.30 p.m., we will continue our People's University, The Struggle for Women's Rights, uh, Jenna, Jarrett, Jara, Jenrette, excuse me, of Edinburgh University, now retired. Uh, we'll discuss the founding mothers, and you'll have a chance if you ask a question to win two of these fine stemless wine glasses that feature suffrage personalities. And you'll have a chance to win two free passes to the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh, courtesy Bob Stakely and the HCAP program, and we thank them for their support of our programs. And we'll get back to that in a, in a little bit when we have our discussion. So uh, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Dr. Nelson Lichtenstein, is distinguished professor in the Department of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he directs the Center for the Study of Work, Labor, and Democracy. Uh, he has written numerous books, but the one we're going to talk about today is The Most Dangerous Man in Detroit, which is his fine biography of Walter Ruther. So here is Dr. Nelson Lichtenstein. Hi, I'm glad to be with you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, well, today is the birthday of Walter Ruther, and uh, he was born in uh, 1907. Uh, right there in, in Wheeling, West Virginia. And he, he came out of a, a family of German socialist, immigrant socialists. He was, as his father was an immigrant, and uh, working class. Uh, very much they valued um, education, uh, self-advancement, uh, humane ideals, uh, and socialist ideals of, of, of equality, of course. Uh, he was not a wobbly, you know, an industrial workers of the world. He, he, that was too, too sort of wild and uh, for him. He, they, he went to Sunday school, you know, and, he, um, and his father always said, you've got to get a trade. And so Walter became a tool and die maker. Um, his brother Roy became a uh, electrician. Victor, his younger brother, went off to college and never got a trade, you know, a kind of solid under, uh, sort of uh, industrial uh, uh, skill. And he always felt, uh, uh, Victor felt uh, sheepish about that. Um, what did it mean to have a, have a trade? Well, he, tool and die makers, he learned this at Wheeling, at Wheeling Steel, and then he went to D Detroit with it. They were the people who who manufactured the dyes that were essential to the stamping out of fenders and carburetors and everything else you, you used. And they, it, was, it was enormous skill involved in being a tool and die maker. You had to shape metal to one ten thousandths of an inch. The, 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 the only contemporary, a contemporary job like that would be a very skilled, say, computer programmer or something at, at Microsoft or, or Facebook. Uh, and when Ruther worked at the, the Rouge, the uh, River Rouge plan of the Ford Motor Company. This was sort of the same thing as Silicon Valley. It was the most advanced, most exciting place uh, to work in a, in a world that's in a, in a company that's reshaping the world. Um, and so Ruther is there and he becomes, I think he's one of the highest paid uh, uh, workers, skilled workers at the Rouge in the early depression. Then of course he goes off with his brother, Victor. They go, they, uh, go off to, to Europe. Um, uh, they're socialists. They want to see what's going on in Europe and in the Soviet Union. And they spend two years in 
33 and 34, early 35, in, a, in they're in Germany when the Nazis take over. Uh, they, you know, and, and they're appalled by that. They're in part of the anti-Nazi resistance. Uh, they go to the, to the Gorky uh, Auto Works in uh, uh, the Soviet Union and help make tractors. Um, and they, you know, because at that time the Soviet Union was, was, was very amenable to having skilled American workers come over. Uh, it, this made Ruther uh, a very cosmopolitan figure. I mean, he was, yes, he was from Wheeling. He didn't go to college. Uh, he was a worker, but he but he'd seen the world and he knew about you know ideologies and knew about what was going on. So Ruther had that combination of um, of kind of a grounded American uh, skill and also a very you know a, a sophisticated sense of what's going on in the world. I should say that his his tool and die making it it, it helped shape. Well, his personality was there to begin with, but it helped shape him. If you, he had, he always had the sense, and this was true of a, the whole cohort of skilled workers in the auto industry. If you were able to be at the absolute center of production, doing the most important thing uh, that was necessary to for a, for a, for to manufacture cars or anything else, well, then you could also mass. You were a master of your own work. You could master society. You could reshape society. You could you could plan it. You could you could manipulate it. You could you could make it make it something that that that, that was you know amenable to your ideals. I mean, tool and die makers were you had to plan things in advance exactly how you were going to make the die and it was and foreman you know uh, they never they would show up once a month and say how are you doing it and the and the tool of die maker said get out of here i'm busy uh and the foreman left they they respected the skill the same was true ruther had that sense about the society as a whole that that the skilled workers uh and, and other workers at the in in they would be coming to the union they could reshape society um and so and and and, and so in, in 1936, he was a he was a socialist, but they they were in favor of Roosevelt, and the socialists in Detroit, uh, where Ruther was was working then, put out a a little leaflet, and I think it's a, a great leaflet. It's, it said, "You voted New Deal at the ballot box and defeated the auto barons. Now get a New Deal in the shop." And I think that expresses the sort of the relationship between politics on the one side and unionism on the other. And it went the other way as well. You you created a strong union in the shop. Now we're going to support politicians who, who support us. And that will be, of course, the case for the UAW during its heyday in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, Ruther's greatest influence came in the 1940s. Um, and he burst on the scene, the national scene, in 1940, uh, in 41 with his famous 500 planes a day plan. Um, at that time, uh, England was fighting the Nazis uh, by itself. The Battle of Britain uh, was going on. Uh, 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 Spitfires and Messerschmitts were fighting over over the skies of London, and the U.S. needed to and the the, the Britain, British needed needed fighters and they needed the airplanes. The American automobile um, industry was reluctant to convert. Uh, to war production. This is before Pearl Harbor. Uh, they were making lots of money selling uh, passenger cars for the first time in the Depression. And um, and Ruther saw this as a both a problem and an opportunity. That is, the, the auto industry and, and all great industries in America, they were not just private capitalists uh, enterprises in which the uh, it was subject to the to uh, what the shareholders wanted uh, they were sort of social institutions uh, they'd been built uh, you know in part with the resources of the nation and certainly the workers who were the were, were there had, had you know had helped build them and so Ruther's 500 planes a day plan was to sort of collectivize and socialize not in a in a property way not not they weren't going to take the property of General Motors or Ford but but in terms of the this problem of building airplanes fast on an assembly line basis you would you would pull the the skilled work the tool the uh, the machine tools the the factories you'd pull them regardless of whether they were Ford or General Motors or Chrysler and and help you know speed Speed auto speed plane production to help defeat the Nazis, and uh, this was a very uh, a popular 
um, uh, among you know liberals and pro-war interventionists. Eventually, much of it was put in place uh, during the war itself. That is what happened. And it it, it and when when during the when the pandemic broke uh, it, here in the United States in the, in in the early spring, uh, everyone was urging Trump to um, put in place the the Defense Production Act, which was an act passed in the in the nineteen late 1940s, which was in fact sort of based on the ideas of Ruther. That is, we should pool and collectivize production uh, when we have a national crisis. And of course that became a controversy because Trump didn't want to do that. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Ruther, um, uh, uh, by the 40s, he, also, he drops his sort of explicitly socialist uh, label, but really the ideas of his you know, kind of variety of of, of well thought out, planned uh, socialist socialist ideas, uh, collectivist ideas I, I carry on, and the UAW uh, comes to embody that. And in, in when he finally becomes the, um, uh, there's a very uh, bitter faction fight inside the UAW, uh, in which Ruther leads a a, a, a sort of a, a sort of a, a, a collection, a faction composed of of, of some socialists. Some uh, clearly anti-communists, uh, some you know uh, other Democrats, and then his po- opponents tended to be a little bit more on the on the uh, the communists supported them, but they were not they weren't communists, but they, they it was just a, a faction fight. It had some meaning, it had some political meaning. I don't want to get into that right now, but anyway, when Ruther finally takes over the Union, you know, and, and wins a great victory, a very democratic victory uh, in 1946 and 47. Uh, He's, he's, he gives a speech. He said, the UAW is the vanguard in America, the vanguard in America, meaning that the ideas that this union puts forward, not just at the bargaining table and collective bargaining, but for the whole, uh, the whole nation as a whole, when it came to planning, to, uh, to um, uh, wage and prices, to uh, Social Security, to medical care, the UAW would be the, in the lead. And I have to say this word vanguard, as you know, has a kind of slightly Leninist uh, flavor to it, um, the Vanguard Party. And that was not an accident that Ruther used that phrase, the Vanguard in America. And that was, and the UAW was the Vanguard in America during the heyday uh, of its power in the 40s and 1950s and even into the 60s. Um, the, um, uh, uh, one of the most, uh, another indication of this, of the, of Ruther's um, and his, and the people, I should say this, Ruther wasn't just Ruther alone. He was this cosmopolitan individual who brought around him a whole kind of brains trust of sophisticated uh, uh, people. Many of them had some had gone to college, some hadn't, but but out of the working class, out of sort of the immigrant community, the people gravitated to the UAW because of the the uh, excitement and the uh, sense, well, well, power and intellect together, you know, is exciting. And so uh, in, in 1945 and 46, uh, Ruther leads the uh, a strike against General Motors. And it wasn't just an ordinary strike. It was a strike which was designed to reshape, uh, you know, the political economy of the country. I mean, General Motors had been making a lot of money uh, during the war. Many, many, many of its factories, this was true for all industry, had been built with U.S. government dollars, about a third of all plant and equipment in the U.S. during the war had been paid for by the government. They were, you know, uh, uh, and uh, now GM was, in, you know, owned that stuff. And so Ruther said, look, again, General Motors is not just a private uh, company. It's a social institution uh, at the center of the American economy, the center of the uh, standard living of the working class. So we demand in the GM strike, uh, he had t- uh, two major demands, open the books, meaning, you know, you, what your, your profit and loss uh, statement, your, your uh, 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 you know, what you know about, uh, you know, uh, how to, how to do, how to produce things and, and your really your, your, pl- your program for the future. This is a, should be subject to, 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 to political debate to open discussion, open the books. Uh, and secondly, uh, he demanded wage increases without price increases. That is, let's redistribute income in America 
more to the working class and more and against the capitalists. Uh, you're making money. Uh, you made lots of money in the World War II. Uh, in the future, let's let's make it. Let's redistribute income in a more egalitarian fashion. And this was a, uh, a, a very advanced and uh, and, and socially uh, uh, progressive uh, uh, campaign. It, the strike lasted three months. Uh, it didn't quite succeed. Uh, that is, uh, there was an inflationary spiral after World War II, but it, it set down a marker that I think was uh, um, uh, that, that, that clearly made the UAW and Ruther the, the sort of the, a, a, the the leaders of of progressive America in that period. Um, uh, the um, uh, and I think that, I mean Ruther would always say, you know. Uh, we don't want just another nickel in the pay envelope. We want to, we, we, you know, we we see air. We see collective bargaining as a le lever to change the nation as a whole. And uh, so, for example, in the fifties, uh, Ruther was able to get uh, much better unemployment benefits, uh, much better pensions, uh, health insurance, etc. Now, this had a, 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 a negative negative side to it, which Ruther thought, and others around him thought, well, the UAW will pioneer this stuff. We will be the vanguard in America. We will, you know. Give Get good pensions for workers. We will get good health health insurance for for workers, and then this will spread to the rest of society. But what happened was with the the uh, sort of the stagnation in the in the growth of the trade union movement and the and the shift to the right in the Cold War. Uh, these uh, you know better wages, uh, 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 better benefits were kind of con consigned to a to a uh, just one segment. Of the society, you know, the the organized working class, steel workers, auto workers, uh, rubber workers, etc., and that meant that they that you really got a kind of privatized welfare state. And today, of course, the uh, the, the the when company paid uh, pensions or health insurance, this is now in sort of a crisis, and we see and and the, and currently, you know, we're trying to get make this again a kind of. Uh, federal program, uh, make this a, a, a universal rather than just depending on where you work. But at the time, Ruther thought this was a this was a way in which we would we would spread these this this to the rest of society in in general. Um, I should make make the point here, and and I think that the overall point is that strong unions and the UAW was the the best example of this. Strong unions in the period from about 1941 to 1973. I mean, this was the period when when the, the standard living of the American working class doubled, doubled. Uh, that never happened in the 20th century uh, any time. It certainly isn't happening today. Uh, and this was a tribute to the, to the power of these, of these unions. Um, but, I think, but, I, but I think there was, a, the, but clearly by the, the end of the 60s, by the 60s, uh, the, the labor had been sort of stalemated in America. We can get into that. Uh, Ruther still had uh, he every time there was a bargaining session every time uh, he worked with LBJ he had all sorts of ideas about revitalizing urban America um, uh, but really the 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 end of the dynamic period of, of Ruther and Rutherism the, he, the phrase was called Rutherism uh, was at a, at a hand Ruther would die in a airplane um, a crash in May of 1970. So he didn't uh, uh, live to see the, the problems of the 1970s and, and afterwards. His brother Victor did, and, and his brother Victor remained a radical and allied himself actually with with um, some people inside the UAW and, and out of it who were who were opponents of the of the uh, kind of the uh, the heirs of Ruther who to, who were leading the union and, and Victor uh, did that all during the 80s and 90s. Um, uh, I should say that that uh, 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 Ruther did. There's one legacy that that did continue. Uh, Ruther died on a uh, uh, airplane trip to Black Lake in northern Michigan, uh, where there was a UAW educational center. Being set up and it's still it's there and and has uh, you know lots of of, uh, of classes and things for, for 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 auto workers and other other workers in the UAW. Uh, there was another educational uh, center that the UAW didn't actually entirely own it. It was owned by the Michigan AFL CIO, but the UAW used it a lot. And that was at Port Huron, um, which was just outside Detroit, and it, it was all used during the '40s and '50s. Ruther thought it was kind of a, a uh, recreational slum, he called it. It wasn't a very nice place, uh, so that's why he wanted to build this better uh, camp at Port Huron, at the Black Lake way in the north, and it was better. It's a much, very beautiful place. But Port Huron 
was the, the scene of the SDS radicals who, who met there in June of 1962 and wrote the Port Huron Statement. And in some ways, this was the best tribute uh, to Ruther because they were really uh, uh, writing a, a program for America with, I think, with many Rutherite ideas in it, but which would be adopted and, and, and carried out by a new generation of radicals. And that was something that, that Ruther was always interested in. So I'll stop now and I, I welcome any questions or anything of that sort you might have. Thank you. Well, thanks for that interesting overview of Ruther's life. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay, good. Um, I'll put them up here so people can read. Uh, one thing I want to start with is I work at the Ohio County Public Library, which evolved from the Wheeling Public Library. Mm. It is not called, it could have been called a Carnegie Library, but it's not. So maybe we could start there. Sure. Oh, yeah, that's a wonderful story because before Ruther was born, his father, Valentine, was a young, uh, vigorous uh, socialist. And uh, in, I think it was 1903 or two or three, the uh, Carnegie, of course, was famous and infamous. He was, he was uh, well, it's, he was infamous uh, because in 1892, Carnegie and his, uh, and Frick, uh, his man in, in Pittsburgh had, had uh, orchestrated the the bloody uh, 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 strike and 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 uh, and and pitch battle between Pinkertons and and uh, striking steel workers at the Homestead Works, and it was a it was a celebrated uh, conflict in which the, the 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 Pennsylvania Guard and I think the Army were called out to defeat workers, and it was a a, a major event in the history of American uh, American labor and 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 the and the triumph of kind of a kind of brutal capitalism that, that certainly lasted well into the New Deal period that from the 1892. Well, Carnegie uh, 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 sells out in 1901 uh, for a, and the first billion dollar company in America, the U.S. Steel was created. And if Carnegie becomes the richest man in America there for, for a while, and he decides to build these libraries, these Carnegie, these these libraries, and um, uh, all over the country, there, there was one in my hometown, the Carnegie Library. Well, that's okay, that's good, but it's the, it's called the Carnegie Library, and it was identified uh, by socialists and, and others as as the the man who would, you know killed workers at Homestead uh, was going to what? And the, so, the, so he he offered, uh, what he would do is he offered um, the city fathers of Wheeling, look, uh, here's 50,000 bucks to build a library. Uh, you Then you have to find the land and, you know, help pay for the pay for some of the books and, and the staffing of it. Well, it became a big kind of issue in Wheeling um, in because the socialists and the, and the left uh, said, wait, wait, we don't, want, we don't want uh, a, a library with the name of this this murderer of, of workers on on it. Uh, the, I think that's one of the slogans was, where in in God's green earth can, uh, you know, is there any place that Carnegie can't get a monument to his money? Uh, so Victor, so Valentine Ruther, a uh, soapbox around the town, it became a big issue. Would the uh, would the city accept the uh, the, um, uh, the library. I think it needed a supermajority to win, and the um, they didn't get it. The, the, the city fathers didn't get it. The 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 the, the socialists and the, and the and the labor movement won. Uh, they rejected the Carnegie Library, but then the city um, they said, "Okay, well, we'll build our own library." And I, they did build it in proletarian South Wheeling. Uh, and as I, I haven't, I haven't. Seen, you must be familiar with it. Uh, but they, they, it was a kind of a symbolic victory, anyway, of the Wheeling working class against this mega rich guy. I mean, you know, uh, uh, of the time. Yeah, it was. And and, and, and Va Valentine was very proud of that, and he told that to his kids, and and it became a legendary uh, event in Wheeling history. Yeah, I love to hear the story. I can never hear it enough. Yeah. Um, uh, so we did have a hello from the Battle of Homestead Foundation in Pittsburgh. Obviously, they're uh, our partners in, uh, wow. in labor uh, weeks. Here's a question from the audience that I thought was a pretty good question. I'll put it up. Uh, would survive the political. Oh, right. Uh, well, well, you know, actually, of course, he he he. Um, 
uh, in the 1950s. I mean, boy, the McCarthyism and the Cold War and socialism was, you know, uh, uh, Ruth, Ruther. What Ruther would say, he he would he would never uh, he would he would say, well, I'm working now through the Democratic Party, uh, but I'm in favor of you know uh, a a. Uh, uh, Many reforms. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, of uh, you know of, of more equitable society. He he never he never repudiated his ideas. Uh, he didn't call them socialist in the 1950s, uh, but he but he was certainly there. And, and when the and by the way, when the civil rights movement began, um, I mean, Ruther had that somewhat ambiguous. Uh, he was of course supporting it in many many formal ways of the civil rights movement. He went to the South. He he provided money for for King and others uh, during some of the demonstrations. Um, uh, the, um, uh, but he thought that the civil rights movement would transform the South and therefore you would finally be able to have a kind of social democratic uh, America with, with states like Alabama and Mississippi being liberal <laughs> bastions rather than, than conservative. Um, he, didn't, he didn't see the, the shift of uh, the, the intransigence of, of, of whites in the South and their shift to the Republican party. Um, I don't think you know. I've never on social booty and things of that sort. Um, well, actually, I, I think Ruther would have actually flourished, and I'll tell you why. He he and his friends, he and his, his you know, it wasn't always just him. He, as I say, he always brought uh, sophisticated and intelligent uh, people around him. It was it was never him alone. Um, he uh, was very adept in the '40s and '50s of having using radio. Uh, using television, in fact, uh, the UAW had a had a very popular uh, radio program called Shift Break, uh, where uh, uh, some of Ruther's people and himself would get on the radio, and they would, you know, it was called Shift Break. You, you would go and, you know, when you when the workers were driving to work, and they, they had radios in their cars, and you know, this was very uh, sophisticated for its time. And uh, Ruther wanted to form a, a a national newspaper put out by the labor movement. That didn't quite happen, but uh, they did have a uh, um, uh, very sophisticated, very very useful um, uh, magazines and 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 called one was called Ammo for UAW shop stewards. So I think actually Ruther would have uh, flourished in the era of social media. Okay, uh, here's another question from the audience. Ah, uh, yes, Warren. Yes, right. Well, um, uh, in. That's a, right. Very good. Uh, Ruther was, was of course, a strong supporter of the Great Society uh, and uh, and and of the war on poverty. He 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 did think, I guess, by the this is before the trade wars with Japan, before China becomes a, a, a and Japan and Germany are, uh, uh, are are eating the cake of the American auto industry. He did think that. Uh, uh, well, he was still a, he still had the ideas of socialism, but he thought American capitalism could work. Uh, that is, you know, American auto companies were pretty sophisticated and productive, and he thought we need to we need to re redistribute some of the, the the money there. But he thought that capitalism was working, and therefore, um, okay, some people are left out: African Americans, Appalachian whites, and the war on poverty. We just have to 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 make them. Uh, 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 take some of the fruits of, of the successful American capitalism. Um, that turned out to be um, not to be the case. Uh, that the and, and the auto industry itself would would have big troubles in the late seventies and, and beyond. Um, the other thing was, I think that when it came to race, um, Ruther, uh, uh, while he was formally. And uh, a, yeah, he he spoke at the, at the at the march on Washington. He was one of the the only uh, one of the few. I mean, certainly the most prominent white to speak at the march on Washington, uh, and he was very proud of that and uh, felt gratified by that. And 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 he helped his union helped support the march on Washington. But when it came to questions internal to the union, uh, Ruther was. Um, Kind of has to put it uh, both both handicapped and blind to the rising tide of African American militancy in the shops and in their demand for more power in the union, and so he was he had to sort of how should I put it uh, run to catch up 
uh, with the African Americans inside the Union itself. And this left a very bad taste. Uh, and and, and there's, you can still find a certain citizenism among African Americans and other people of color uh, when it comes to the Rutherite leadership inside the UAW. I mean, they would say, well, look, you're marching with Chavez in Chicago, in, 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 in California. You're marching with King uh, and others in Alabama. But what about Detroit? What are you doing in Detroit? You know, And so that became a, a certain controversy there. Okay, well, while we're on the subject, I did want to show uh, this image because it comes from our art, little yeah. archive in Wheeling. Yeah. It was produced by Barry Goldwater. And so uh, you can see uh, automatically the association with MLK. Yeah. Uh, this, this made uh, Ruther an extremist. Yeah. yeah. So I, I thought I'd ask about that. And also the, uh, the idea that he kind of had strong opposition from both the left and the right. He was a communist to the right. Yeah. And he was a conservative, maybe right. to the left. So can you just talk yeah. about that? Yeah, yeah, good, very good question. Uh, yeah, Ru Ruther was, I mean, let me just on the communist question. Ruther worked closely with the communists. Maybe he may, maybe he was a member of the party for a year or so in, in the middle, just after he got back from the Soviet Union. Uh, that's sort of an open question. I'm, I'm willing to take go either way. Was he a card-carrying member of the party for a year, or was he not? And to me, uh, I, I'm open to that. Uh, it, I don't think it matters that much because by the late '30s, he was a uh, he was part of a faction that was against the communists, uh, you know, and was he was still a socialist, but he was against the against the communists themselves, and he and he fought them all during the 1940s and into the early 50s. Um, now. Uh, but what's more interesting, actually, is Goldwater. So Goldwater is a conservative Republican, of course, um, uh, and was very anti-labor. He, he's known as a, you know, a, a big anti-communist. He was, but he was equally and even more so in some ways anti-labor. Um, and in 1957, there was the famous um, uh, hearings chaired by uh, Senator McClellan, you know, into corruption in the in the in the unions, and of course Jimmy Hoffa is most famously, you know, put on the carpet and you know, and is kind of belligerent. And but Walter Ruther is also called before this uh, this uh, commit this committee. Now Ruther uh, and the UAW were basically the, 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 at least the kind of corruption that we think of with uh, associated with Hoffa, none of that was in the UAW the, uh, uh, at all. Uh, and Ruther came out of those hearings uh, clean as a whistle, et cetera. However, Barry Goldwater would said at the time, I think he said it publicly, he said, I'd rather deal with Jimmy Hoffa than Walter Ruther. Jimmy Hoffa just wants to take our money. Walter Ruther wants to take our freedom. And what he meant by freedom there was the freedom of capitalists to do whatever they damn well pleased with their with their property and with their profits and and, and with the workers. Uh, now, yes, and it's true, Walter Ruther was ambitious in that respect. He wanted to deprive capitalists of, the, of, of their uh, freedom. And so the right saw uh, Ruther as a real bogey buggy man in this period, the 50s and, and 60s. Uh, and, uh, you know, they would, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they saw the, the, uh, the, the, the union as, as, you know, as uh, too powerful. Uh, and so, the, yes, the, the, the Goldwater would, would put, he had one poster, I think when he, um, I think it was in the late 50s, uh, you know, in which uh, they said, defeat the, the Ruther, you know, Slater. They had, they, had, they had Ruther, his picture, uh, you know, running for every office that every Democrat wanted. I mean, because there was a sense, sense that Ruther was manipulating the Democrats behind, uh, behind the back. This wasn't true at all. In fact, Ruther's power in the Democratic Party was declining. But uh, uh, the, the, big labor, the idea of big labor as, as sort of the, the, the power behind the throne was, was something the right uh, latched onto very strongly in this period. Okay, um, thank you. Here's a question from the archivist at the current archivist at the Ruther Library in Wayne State. Oh. Uh, the answer is no. The answer is no. And um, uh, there was there was speculation, you know, various moments, you know, I mean, the, the would say, oh, Ruther, he's, he, especially the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, he was very popular. Oh, he should run for office. He would run for office. And But in my biography, in my biography of him, I make this point. Ruther was supremely ambitious uh, uh, 
uh, politically and economically. He was, he was ambitious, no doubt about it. But his ambition was far more profound and important than just running for office. Uh, he wanted to change the, the, the bedrock uh, structures of society. Uh, uh, he, he just getting somebody elected, or, or you know, or himself certainly was not about to do that. He he wanted he, and so he, he yes, he 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 wanted he supported various kinds of candidates. Uh, you know, in the in the Democratic Party, uh, toyed with the idea of a Labour Party in the late nineteen forties, but he was never for himself. Um, uh, did he? Did he? Did he? Did he think about political office? Because he thought that was not, not as important, not as important as the UAW becoming stronger and more powerful and bargaining and making its political weight felt, you know, in various in, in state legislatures or on the national scene. Uh, so the, I think the, the I mean I, I'm willing to say a, a definitive no on that uh, because not because he, uh, he was a a, 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 a wallflower or a, you know a not but because he was ambitious, he wasn't going to run for office. Very good. Uh, here's a question from a gentleman who came to Wheeling from Michigan. Um, yeah, what well, a good question. That is a good question. The, he was proud of the fact that he came from Wheeling. Uh, they would return to Wheeling, you know, for family reunions all the time, as long as his parents were, were alive, uh, through, certainly through the 30s and the 40s. Um, yes, he, he, he was, yeah, he, he didn't think of himself as an Appalachian, not at all. He thought of himself as coming out of the industrial working class and immigrant working class German, uh, proud of his German roots. Um, and he and he enjoyed very much coming back to Wheeling, a little more rural than Detroit, uh, you know. And the, the family had a had a kind of place. I believe it was a, a little bit out in the country. Um, and uh, but but you know he didn't think of himself as Appalachian. That was not his his identity uh, at all. Um, uh, and uh, and and later on, and I should say part of his cosmopolitan uh, sense, he marries uh, May Wolf. Who is from a Jewish immigrant family? Uh, his um, friends, his best friends, are sort of intellectuals uh, in Detroit. Uh, he's very, very uh, uh, um, uh, at ease in, in this other world. So he's not. He he doesn't think of himself as an Appalachian. No. Okay. Uh, here's another question from the Battle of Homestead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I a good, a, well, the hard question, a good, good question. Uh, which, uh, what, what is the legacy of Walter Ruth? That's a very, uh, you know, and, and so what is, yes. Well, I do think it, it, it is that a trade union movement to be successful has to have both a political side to it and an industrial side to it. Uh, that you have to have both, and that that if you think that you can just sort of cut a deal. Uh, with uh, whoever your your bargaining partner is, that's not going to work because there are all sorts of things going on in the world, uh, international competition and politics uh, that are going to get in the way. Now, I have to, I might as well say this, there's a lot of people in this country uh, who think that, I mean, Detroit has had a lot of problems uh, that, oh, that's that's because the auto workers were greedy and, and wanted to, and, and, and wanted too much. And so naturally uh, industry closed down or went away. And that's some, that's a, an idea that's propagated by the, by the American right. And it's really seeped into American culture. And I find that all, you know, all the time. I think that the, the, the mobility of capital uh, which is what happened. That is, you know, auto companies in Detroit, they'd say, well, we're going to build our next plant in Mexico or, or China, for that matter. GM produces more cars in China today than it does in the U.S. Um, this mobile, the middle mobility of capital is the Achilles heel of the labor movement in the United States. It has been for years. Uh, Ruther tried to figure out a way to, to stop that, to sort of get controls on capital. This means controls on finance, controls on Wall Street. Uh, <clears throat> and, but without that, yes, you, if you raise wages in Detroit, uh, capital is just gonna, it's gonna take off. So what's, what's the alternative? Don't raise wages, live miserably, li live, at the, live at the same standard living uh, as, as people abroad? No. So I think the, the answer is that, that, that and this is a, one legacy of Ruther, a, a trade union movement has to be ambitious. Uh, in in this in this uh, not just uh, I said not just a kind of 
political way in a kind of you know electoral politics, but ambitious in a, in a in a broader sense in reshaping society and getting controls today. The question is how do we get controls on finance? And I think that is something that uh, is, is is the task of the of the left in America. Okay, um, well. Maybe this is a good one to end on. And this is another book you wrote called State of the Union, which I've been looking at. And so maybe you could comment on, you know, I talk to people all the time who you would think would be pro-union. Mm -hmm. They're vehemently anti-union. And so how has this happened? How did the... Yeah, good question, yeah. I, I think partly it is this, that uh, we have had, I mean, you know, all throughout the industrial Midwest and Appalachia, certainly, West Virginia, you know, we've had an economic disaster. We've had an economic disaster. So people want to blame that on someone. And I think capital and, 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 and you know, a, a financier in, in Wall Street who is saying, oh, let's, you know, we'll lend you the money if you build your factory in, in China and not in, not in, uh, in Pittsburgh, you know, that's, that's removed. That's, that's something maybe on page 38 of the, the financial pages. But the trade union, which is right, you know, which they know that working people and others in, in, in West Virginia and in Michigan, you know, they know people who are in trade unions. They know people who work, you know, that's right there. And, you know, some union is, 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 is facing this d disaster situation. And mm -hmm. it's sort of it, because it's so close to them, it's right there. They can see it. Then they blame it. And they blame it, and you and the kind of the the hidden hand of capital, which which functions in this more remote way and more powerful way, I think is is given a, a pass. And I think it's a question of education and a question, and also a question that 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 unions. I mean, the other thing is, to the extent that unions have been on the defensive, for good or bad reasons, for whatever reasons. Um, uh, and people say, well, they can't do anything. And it's like a Stockholm syndrome. If you can't, if the, if the union can't do anything, why ally with it? Let's, let's ally with the, uh, with the, uh, the, 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 the people who are powerful, whether, you know, whether, you know, uh, that, that there's that, that sort of psychological thing takes place as well, which is why we need, uh, you know, a, a union movement, which is dynamic and which is, uh, powerful and which is, uh, uh, which is yeah. the, the irony is here, the, that the weaker the union movement becomes, the more it is labeled as big labor, uh, ironically. Uh, the more a union movement can take wages out of competition, can impose its, its, uh, its, its uh, vision on the rest of society, the more popular it becomes. And then the UAW was very popular when it was powerful back in the 40s and 50s. Well, uh on that note, I, I want to thank you for participating today and for your excellent presentation and answering our questions. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Stein. I'll let you off the hook now, and good luck with your future projects. All right, you are. Stay tuned. We're going to premiere our video tribute to Walter Ruther right now. Great.
archives of the UAW. All right, I'm being told and, that uh, our video does not have sound, so I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Let me let me play it again from the beginning and see if we can fix that. Dear Walter, we're keeping your ideas alive here at the Walls Foundation, and thank you for being one of the most eloquent Americans to articulate that our working citizens will never achieve economic justice unless and until they do so alongside their African-American brothers and sisters. I love that you said, black is beautiful, and white is beautiful, but most beautiful of all is when black and white march <clears throat> together. You were Wheeling's own bright light in the civil rights struggles of the 60s and 70s, and one of the first to internalize as part of your public character that black lives matter. We hope that your spirit continues to infuse us all, not only in Wheeling, but across our land. Happy birthday and cheers. Hello from Detroit at the Walter P. Ruther Library of Labor and Urban Affairs. Um, we are the official archives of the UAW, and uh, we have Walter Ruther's personal papers here. My name is Gavin Strassel. I am the UAW's official archivist here at the Ruther Library, and I just want to say happy birthday, Walter Ruther. Um, as somebody who gets to work with uh, Walter's uh, personal uh, papers and artifacts that, you know, go from his early childhood all the way to uh, his career in the UAW. I think what makes him so special is that he was connected to so many things we take for granted today and so many things that we hold as uh, the most important causes of our times, um, you know, from civil rights to, uh, you know, uh, workers' rights to even things like environmentalism. Uh, his legacy is something that's really special. And uh, here at the Ruther Library, we uh, want to share it with the world. Um, we have, you know, things uh, from that belong to him, uh, things from the UAW. Uh, we even have uh, this mural that used to hang in his local at uh, Detroit's West Side, Local 174. You can see Walter right here. This is him at the Battle of the Overpass. So uh, it's a great place. If you're ever in Detroit, please visit us. And uh, again, uh, happy birthday and uh, have a great day. Dear Walter, as a young college graduate, I worked in Washington, D.C. for two social change organizations that you and the UAW supported the Citizens Crusade Against Poverty and its successor, the Center for Community Change. Throughout my employment, I was guided and mentored by an amazing group of leaders closely associated with you. Your colleagues directly influenced my values, my thinking, my career. I am the person I am today due to them. So on behalf of Dick Boone, Jack Conway, Joe Rao, Anita Curtis, Hortense Gable. I am here today in Wheeling, West Virginia, and we are wishing you a very happy birthday. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Tom Briding, and I am at the Appalachian Institute here at Wheeling University, where I've worked since 2012. Uh, Sean asked me to say a few words about Walter Ruther for his birthday. And uh, Walter 
of course, came from Wheeling, my hometown. Uh, he left at the age of 19 years old, went to Detroit to work in the Ford factory. Uh, he was a brilliant man, incredibly smart, learned so quickly, and uh, soon his travels took him all over the world. And I believe what Walter's travels led him to understand was just how important each life is and how important economic justice is in the lives of people. People who are willing to work hard should be rewarded with a life that is comfortable, a life where uh, they don't have hunger or starvation. Um, and of course, I, I, Walter understood too that the way to achieve that economic justice was through solidarity. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, the union makes us strong. When the union's inspiration through the worker's blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? The union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. The union makes us strong. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving, mid the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, the union makes us strong. They have taken untold millions that they never toiled to earn, but without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, the union makes us strong. I'm Dr. David Jabersack, American historian. My dissertation at West Virginia University was on the Ohio Valley Trades and Labor Assembly. And one of the early presidents in the 20th century was a man by the name of Valentine Ruther, whose son, Walter Ruther, born just before Labor Day in 1907, is Wheeling's greatest contribution to the American history. He was identified as such by none other than the Wall Street Journal. And I'm here to wish Walter, a happy birthday, would be 113. And this year, I think, is very memorable because the issues that we're dealing with in this time of pandemic, in which people are putting their lives on the line for others, is exactly what Walter Ruther did for his entire career. He put his life on the line. He was shot, he was attacked, died in a terrible plane crash, but he was an extraordinary man who did extraordinary things for everyday people. There is a quote that I think that sums up Ruther better than anything else. And that quote is this, there is no greater calling than to serve your fellow man. There is no greater contribution 
than to help the weak. And there is no greater satisfaction than to have done it well. He stands as the epitome of somebody who puts the community ahead of himself. He is Wheeling's greatest contribution to American life. Hi, my name is Dan Graff. I'm a labor historian at the University of Notre Dame, where I also direct the Higgins Labor Program. And I'm delighted to wish Walter Ruther a happy birthday, 2020. Um, I consider Walter Ruther probably the most important 20th century American that, that most people have never heard of, despite his importance in US history. Uh, if, if anyone in the United States can be identified as most important to the creation of a, the American middle class society of the post-World War II era, it would be Walter Ruther. Uh, as president of the United Auto Workers, as a leading, most imaginative labor leader of the entire post-war period, uh, and as a prominent uh, policy and public intellectual, Ruther didn't have any peers. Um, so, you know, I just mentioned three three reasons why I think he's super important. One is that uh, under Ruther's leadership, the United Auto Workers in the post-war era, 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, created, no pun intended here, the Cadillac of contracts that gave workers the best wages and benefits uh, in world history for working people and spilled over into all other sectors. So the contracts that the UAW negotiated with General Motors, Ford and Chrysler that provided uh, not only good wages, uh, but also benefits like paid vacations, uh, pensions, uh, as well as that, that protection from uh, arbitrary dismissal or termination that really created the notion of an American middle-class job as sort of American standard of living. So we, we shouldn't forget how important that was. Um, the second reason is Ruther really envisioned workers playing a critical role in American politics. And he thought labor unions uh, and led by labor leaders such as himself should play a prominent role in policy. Ruther came up with the idea that became the Peace Corps, for example. Ruther came up with some of the ideas that led to the creation of the cabinet level position of housing and urban development. Ruther and the UAW were central to the passage of the Civil Rights Act uh, in supporting uh, that to eliminate racial discrimination in the labor market. Uh, so without Walter Ruther's leadership, uh, 20th post-World War II 20th century social policy would look very, very different. And then the third thing I'll just say is that uh, we need representatives of working people in the public sphere representing and giving voice to workers' interests. Uh, we don't really have that uh, that powerfully today, and Ruther played that central role. Um, so it's a tragedy that he has largely been forgotten and dropped from American memory because he was uh, talking to presidents, consulting throughout the 50s and 60s. Uh, he was in the public sphere, widely covered by the press any time he announced any kind of proposal or raised an issue about the division of labor in American society, about the, the ways in which the fruits of our collective labor were divided, making sure that workers had dignity at the job and in American culture more broadly. Uh, so it's just a, a nice honor to be able to well, uh, give, give a shout out to Walter Ruther on his birthday and to participate in this. So thanks very much. Hi, my name is Nick Musgrave, and I'm an amateur historical writer here in Wheeling, West Virginia, and I want to extend a very special happy birthday to Mr. Walter Ruther. Uh, I am actually a Michigan native living in Wheeling, where Walter was a Wheeling native who made his career in the auto industry in Michigan. So I've always had kind of a special connection um, with him. We kind of would have passed ways on uh, Route 23, I guess you could say. So happy birthday to Walter Ruther and the, uh, the fight goes on. Hi, I'm John Hare. I'm the president of the Battle of Homestead in Homestead, Pennsylvania. Uh, we are kindred spirits with uh, all the people in Wheeling that are celebrating today through your wonderful seminars and 
uh, opportunities for education. We say happy birthday, Walter Ruther. You are a star that we study a lot when we try to learn about the labor movement and how to put forward a progressive labor movement and how to plan for the jobs that we will have in the future and the economy that we will have in the future. Happy birthday, Walter Ruther. Hi folks, my name is Rosemary Ketchum. I am the newly elected city council person for the third ward here in Wheeling, West Virginia. And today we are celebrating the birthday of Walter Ruther. Walter uh, is such a powerful force uh, for West Virginia, but also has been a powerful force across the nation. And what he represents to me is the power of allyship. He cares about uh, civil rights and social justice um, before uh, this was um, a mainstream concept uh, on social media and in the world. He, he you know, stood on the front lines um, with folks like Martin Luther King fighting for social justice and racial justice uh, and was a true ally. And I'm so proud uh, to be uh, here in Wheeling uh, and so thankful that we have somebody representing uh, our state in history like Walter Ruther. So happy birthday, Walter. We love you. Which side are you on? 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 They say in Harlan County, there are no neutrals there. You either be a union man or a thug for J.H. Blair. Which side are you on? 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 My daddy was a miner. And I'm a minor son, I'll be with you fellow workers till this battle's won. Which side are you on? 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 Well, Jeffrey's here. I just want to start out by saying that I am a 38-year UAW member. And I really would like to thank Walter for everything he's done for labor and for civil rights and for the working men and women of this country. I have tried to honor Walter by being active in my union, UAW Local 2147. Also, we are active with the Lima Troy Cap Council and a highlight of our career has been getting the Walter Ruther Award from the Lima Troy Cap Council. Hi, I'm Carol Jeffries, uh, Salina, Ohio, and uh, happy Labor Day to everybody, and happy birthday to Walter. I just want everybody to know uh, we follow the tenets of Walter. I admire Walter, even though I am not a direct UAW member. I am a household member, and we live by the tenets of Walter and all of the things that he has done to forward the working men and women of the United States. Um, he's given, he's a championship of labor. He is one of them who has, um, he was a very leading civil rights leader. We helped the Lima area um, Cap Council and the Central Labor Council of West Central Ohio. And uh, one of the big things is social justice, equality for all. And that is one of the things that we live our life for, we've raised our kids for, and we have Walter to thank for that. He has advanced that movement greatly and brought it to the forefront. And the UAW is a leader in equality for all, men, women, doesn't matter your religion, doesn't matter your race. Everybody is equal, and the UAW to this day lives by that rule. His legacy uh, will go on, and I think on Labor Day is the day that we have that we can thank all of the working men and women of labor in the United States and all of the leaders that have come before us that have given us these rights, they've won these um, gains for us. We have insurance, we have all kinds of things as everybody in general because of them and we need to thank them. So again, we'd like to thank you for your support for this great man 
and we'd like to thank Walter and his family for everything they've done for us. So happy Labor Day to everybody, and happy birthday, Walter. Happy birthday, Walter. Good afternoon. Delegate Sean Fluard here, represent the 3rd District and the House of Delegates here in Ohio County and the City of Wheeling. I want to give a happy birthday to Walter Rupert. And on a personal note, uh, just to talk about how I think about Walter, my dad just recently retired as a union member, local IBW 141. And through Walter's work for the UAW and the strong labor unions we had back in the day, my father and my grandfather and many people in my family were able to not only work with dignity, but now retire with dignity. And I think that's very important as we talk about the labor movement and the contributions that Walter made. And one thing that stands out from Walter's contributions, not just on the labor side of things, but how he used labor to push social justice, which today in 2020 is front and center. The conversations we're having in this country right now, and they're vital for us to progressively move forward. So I think when I think about the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Walter played an intricate role in getting that across the finish line and moving social justice to the forefront. He really was ahead of his time. So I'd like to thank him and give a shout out and happy birthday, Walter. Hello, I'm Nelson Lichtenstein. I uh, teach history at the uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, and I'm the author of a biography of Walter Ruther, the well-known and important trade union leader who was born in Wheeling. Uh, it's entitled, The Walter Ruther, The Most Dangerous Man in Detroit. Um, Ruther was the important because he led the most important union in America, the auto workers, during its most powerful and, and influential uh, era, that is the 1930s and 40s and 50s. And um, many of the ideas that and and, and, and activities that he uh, uh, that, the, that the union uh, got involved with, and that he was in, as and he was its leader for a quarter century, uh, I think those um, uh, live with us today, and they and they have relevance today. Walter said of the United Automobile Workers, "It is the vanguard in America, meaning it will lead the country out of its troubles." I think that's still true for for labor and for the trade union movement. So I wanna wish uh, Walter Ruther a happy birthday. He was born on September 1st, 1907, uh, and he died in May of the year 1970. Hello, I'm Sasha Ruther, Victor Ruther's grandson uh, from here in New York City. I'm a film and TV producer, and I am, here to say how grateful I am for uh, my family and the Ruther brothers and great-grandfather Valentine and what they mean to me and to American history. Um, you know, I, I think at the highest level, they, um, they dedicated their lives to the betterment of society and their fellow man. Uh, it was, I think, to them always much bigger than just the union movement or um, the solidarity they forged on, you know, in the auto plants. Yes, they certainly, uh, you know, in the history books and most notably fought for and won unprecedented rights uh, for workers, uh, improving conditions and um, dignity on the shop floor and the workplace, uh, fighting and negotiating and winning vacation pay and pensions and health care, which uh, certainly expanded to many other industries, much wider than the auto industry and even much wider than um, unionized jobs in general. So that was an incredible impact and really was a large part, uh, not them alone, but um, others of their generation of organizers in building the middle class in America. Uh, they also, the union movement itself and what they did specifically in the UAW fostered a tremendous sense of community being part of that union. Uh, solidarity on and off the job, um, whether it would be education programs and team building and uh, just family support in general. Um, and then the extension of that movement was, uh, I, I think both brothers, I'm uh, sorry, uh, all three brothers and, and Walter being the leader, forging the relationship with the civil rights movement and really being a large part of the coalition of conscience. Understanding that the civil rights movement and the workers' rights movement were, their goals were one and the same. It 
was about equality. And so I think that uh, the Ruther brothers' impact on, on that movement specifically was um, financially supportive and also physically supportive. Being there, uh, being the early organizers of the March on Washington and supplying um, you know, many of the pickets and banners there and financial support and bailing Dr. King out of jail multiple times. Uh, believing that they they this was both movements workers and civil rights gained from this kind of a coalition uh, so that was certainly a big contribution that um, the Ruther brothers uh, were a part of uh, you know I think that it's it's interesting these three brothers um, you know they they were very much alike but it was their individual contributions that came together to forge to create this incredible sort of Trinity uh, yes, Walter Ruther in the leadership leadership position at the UAW, but Roy um, being the sort of uh, the, the legislative and political action director was about uh, building allies in um, other social activist movements like Cesar Chavez and the farm workers and also political allies like Bobby Kennedy. Uh, and then my grandfather, Victor, being the edu first the education director and then the international director of the union, uh, that was forging, creating allies abroad, um, understanding what was happening, not just with auto workers abroad, but greater union movements, um, India, Germany, um, uh, Japan, uh, far reaching. So I think that they that that was also a very unique contribution is having, you know, the, the brothers united. That this this is something that you know an understanding a trust and a bond uh, that grew over a lifetime that could be it was very unlike um, you know a lot of other partnerships and work uh, and certainly that all uh, you know it came it was influenced greatly by their father Valentine um, my great grand grandfather and it was certainly growing up uh, in Wheeling West Virginia. Their father was uh, a union organizer himself, uh, a beer wagon driver. They, having grown up um, in Wheeling, West Virginia, they certainly were around and witnessed the horrendous working conditions in the mining industry. Uh, and Valentine impressed upon the boys and all of his children uh, really general values in life, being selfless, uh, speaking speaking out and standing up for your neighbor. Uh, and, and also learning both sides of an issue uh, to be highly skilled in debate and negotiation, understanding you know, your position and also turning around uh, and playing the other side of the table. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm grateful on a personal note, being Victor Ruther's grandson, that these values uh, were imparted on, uh, on me. Um, you know, for my parents, but also the individual time that I spent with my grandfather. And it wasn't just the respect for people from all walks of life, but it was uh, the genuine curiosity about the world uh, and humanity and hunger for knowledge and history. And that's what I do in my work as a, a TV and film producer is um, I do historical documentaries. I'm, you know, my activism is to educate. So I'm very grateful and, and really I, you know, I obviously speak very highly of them, but this is a, a genuine uh, a personal thankful and a pers personal thank you that I give to the Ruther brothers uh, and my great grandfather, Valentine. And I just wanna say uh, happy birthday, Walter, from New York City, all the best. This story tells of the greatest labor leader of this century. Walter P. Ruther, a man who truly lived what he had believed. Born in West Virginia, Walter Ruther was his name. One in four of the sons of a man who taught his sons to take a stand, to fight for the rights of yours and his fellow man. I've had a life that's self-fulfilled and rich in teaching me. Spoken were these words of a man who lived what he believed. Social justice was his aim for the common man. He would attain to a better life. He opened the door no labor he had ever done before. 
Okay, that's our video. Sorry for the trouble at the beginning. I hope you enjoyed it. And please uh, consider joining us this Saturday for more about Walter Ruther and labor in general at our Ruther Pollock Labor History Symposium. Saturday, starting at 11 a.m. See you then. And thanks again, Dr. Lichtenstein and uh, everyone who participated today. Have a good day. Happy birthday, Walter Ruther.